My name is Douglas Orr, and I uh, just retired uh, from 30 years of law enforcement in criminal justice, uh, Spokane Police Department. I spent 20 years there, I spent five years with the Idaho State Police, and then five years with the police department in Greenville, South Carolina. Um, among a lot of that, I uh, went back to grad school and in 2005, graduated with my PhD in criminal justice from Washington State University. Since then, I've been teaching in the, in the traditional classroom at Gonzaga University and then uh, recently moved to the East Coast here to retire. Right before I retired in, in 2014, I was able to uh, participate in the, <laughs> the political process, believe it or not, to run for sheriff in Spokane County. Um, this um, came with a lot of thought and something I had not been exposed to before, but it seemed that there was a need uh, for someone to run for sheriff and to, to, to introduce the, the community to what we call smart justice, because Spokane County, uh, much like a lot of other um, you know, mid-sized communities, had been struggling with this idea of having too many people in their jail and not having the right people in jail and having the wrong people in jail. And it seemed like everything was... Uh, all of their policies were very archaic, and it didn't seem like the, the current administration or the current leadership there uh, was going to fix it. A lot of us in the community believed that uh, it was time for uh, a new change of leadership, but we, we couldn't do that through the, uh, as an activist or through the political process, so a lot of us just thought about just running. Um, a lot of uh, my good friends, uh, one ran for county commissioner, the other one ran for prosecutor, and then I ran for sheriff. Uh, I was running um, against an, a two-time incumbent uh, and a very popular sheriff, a guy by the name of Ozzie Knizovic, uh, and again, a very popular name, Ozzie. So what I'll do is I'll just run through that, and I'll, I'll tell you the, 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 the way we studied it uh, after the election. Um, the idea was to go ahead and I was told that in order to win this election or to try to win it was to contact the pure voter. And the pure voter, what I mean by that is the person who votes in every election. And as we'll learn here later here, uh, Spokane County has about a half a million people, but really there's only about 14,000 people in the county that vote in every election. That's every midterm election, every uh, small election, whether they're voting to change uh, the color of the grass. I mean, these people vote in every election. And the idea was that you need to contact these people to have any kind of standing in, in the primary or general election. So, okay, we're gonna run, for, we're gonna run on a smart justice platform, we're gonna contact the pure voter. Uh, the idea was to offer them uh, something different. Uh, uh, a candidate that uh, not only was a police officer and, and knew, the, knew the, the landscape, but also who someone was very educated and something that they hadn't uh, had before. And so offering at that time a very different candidate was something new for this, this type of community. But I agreed to do it. And I, I said, you know, even if I win or lose, uh, we have to study it and study it well. So let me run through this real quickly. Uh, the literature review that I did on it, uh, mainly when we talk about political processes and political uh, elections, uh, more or less turns out or, or talks about turnout and uh, how many people were going to get to come to vote, not necessarily for which election. Um, and a lot of that was in surveys and a lot of it had to do with preference and who they were going to vote for uh, as far as a Republican or Democrat, not specifically a sheriff. And, and to affect any kind of change in, in, as a policymaker, you know, the sheriff, especially in a lot in the South and in the, uh, the West, the sheriff is, is the the uh, chief law enforcement officer of the county and really directs law enforcement policy. So that, that was the aim, that was the target. A lot of the other literature talks about campaign finance, but nothing really about running for sheriff and, and trying to change policy as it relates to criminal justice. Um, if you look at the pure voter, and I'll talk about this in just a second, but to, to get information on a pure voter is very, very expensive. Um, but what information is available is from proprietary firms and you can find out a lot about uh, the race, the gender, the age, the party preference, their marital status, their religion, and a few other interesting things. But as you see on the right there, the map of uh, Spokane County and all the voting precincts. Uh, and these numbers I'm not gonna really dwell on because the pure voter in Spokane County is white and they are old. And you're gonna see that in some of the numbers here, gender, 
uh, nothing surprising here. Uh, females are a lot more, a little bit more democratic than males. Males are a little bit more Republican, uh, independent or nonpartisan, kind of spread there between the two age. Uh, your lost generation or your, your really old people, a um, little bit more uh, Republican, baby boomers just a tad bit more, you know, Democratic, and the next generation a little bit more Democratic. Uh, when I got this list, I did the average age of the 14,000 people that I was going to have to go door to door for, and uh, the average age was 72. And in, I would probably say in each precinct, I'd probably try to hit a precinct every night on foot, take me about three hours in the evening. And in the summertime, that was, that was not too hard to do. But going door to door, I probably averaged one or two people out of the precinct that had died. They were simply, you know, you'd look on the sheet and say 95 years old and the house would be empty or family members would be there saying, oh, this person is deceased. So the, the population of people who are voting, who are pure voters, are very, very old. Um, party, uh, this was something that was very interesting. Uh, the divided households were uh, one spouse was Republican, one spouse was, was Democrat. Um, just a lot of strong unity, but there was some, some disunity. And uh, I'd like to explore that in other, in other writings. Uh, marital status, uh, non-traditional was represented in this, in this uh, statistical uh, package that I purchased, uh, which was kind of strange for Spokane County being very, very conservative uh, to have a turnout like that. Religion, nothing surprising here. People identified as Protestant, uh, Catholic, or, or over here on the left, far left is, is Christian. Um, but let's go through this really quickly. And, and again, I am not a politician, never knew how to do this. And I tried to hire the best when it came to campaign managers and I tried to listen to them. Um, but we're gonna look at, at some things here that, that take, uh, make up an election, a local election on the county, uh, county platform is that the setting, and we'll talk about the, the community, the, uh, the, the labor, I mean, people who are uh, the competing interests, fundraising, and especially politics. Uh, you kind of have a, a good laugh there. But uh, you, you file for office, you do some fundraising, you advertise, and you attend these community forums, and there may be two people there, there may be 500 people there. It, you never know what you're gonna get when you turn out to speak to a group. Um, then there's, of course, the primary election, and then you have more forums, then you have debates near the general election, and then you have the final general election. In the state of Washington, where I was uh, campaigning, uh, they have a top two um, primary, so the, the top two candidates make it through the primary to go on to the general. Myself and the incumbent were running, so we had a primary simply because we were allowed to raise more money after that, but it was really, it wasn't uh, consequential to anything. You look at the setting, Spokane County, half a million people. Uh, more than 90% of them are Caucasian. Uh, there's about um, half of those people are registered and half of those voted in 2014. There are about 344 voting precincts and about 163,000 households in Spokane County. Uh, median income is very low. It's about $35,000 a year. And Washington State, uh, as well as Oregon, they have the, uh, the mail-in ballot system. You can you can go to a poll, but uh, most people just fill out their ballot and mail it in. Um, at the time, we had a very prominent uh, person, an icon in our police department who was uh, arrested for uh, civil rights violations. Uh, what he thought was a, a burglar, uh, he ended up tussling with a, a mentally ill a janitor. And uh, during the struggle, the, the person expired. Um, Carl, you see there on the right, Carl was charged with civil rights violations and um, he was ultimately convicted uh, for the baton strikes and uh, served four years in prison uh, for civil rights violations. A very tough time for our agency. Uh, I've known Carl for 30 years and it was, it was difficult to see a, a friend uh, go to jail. But something that I was dealing with as a candidate was uh, I was always being tied to him. And uh, that made police oversight a whole lot more, more important. There were also some, on the county side, the office that I was running for, the sheriff had also made some very high profile terminations. Uh, he had fired deputies, a lot of them for having sex on duty. Um, and, and again, probably some, some righteous terminations, however, they weren't done within the guidelines and the union uh, was fighting these, these uh, terminations and ultimately winning because of all the mistakes that were made in the grievance process. Uh, labor, Washington state is a, a collective bargaining state. so. They, they do have competing interests there, and it is, uh, is very important to, to secure their at least favor or to secure uh, uh, an interest in, in what they want. 
They do have binding arbitration there. And uh, of course, getting the endorsement of the Deputy Sheriff's Association is, is all important. If you, if you don't get that, you, you probably might as well not even run. Um, this also brings about some party conflict. Uh, union has always uh, sided with the Democrats. And uh, so the Republican Party has always been very down on unions. Um, and that caused a, a great rift as well with, with my running because I came out as, as pro-labor. Um, being, being from Philadelphia, uh, originally, I, I knew how important that was. Uh, but more, more like a Nixon Republican, that, that's how I, I looked at it and felt that, you know, why disenfranchise the, uh, the, the working man? So uh, I, I, I wanted to listen to them and be sympathetic to them. Uh, whether to run as a Republican or Democrat, I, I consider myself very down the middle. And when it comes to government, I like less of it. But when it comes to the social issues, I, I seem to be very uh, understanding and very objective. Um, so, uh, in order to win in, in Spokane County, uh, being as conservative as it is, you really have to run as a Republican or an independent. Uh, Democrats usually only take about 40% of the vote, and the incumbent in this, in this particular instance was Republican, and very popular Republican, and very establishment Republican. Also, uh, what you're dealing with there is because of the, the, the Romney uh, election of 2012, you're also looking at... Um, a very, very strong uh, Mormon influence there in, in Spokane, Washington. Uh, the Republican Party uh, actively was only about 500 people in, in, um, in about uh, you know 20, uh, uh, 2008. In 2012, uh, active members were probably about 5,000. Um, so uh, a lot of people that you have to meet on their level there in the, the Mormon influence. And in fact, my my the incumbent and my opponent was was in fact uh, Latter Day Saints. So he had a, a lot of uh, a lot of pull there in that crowd. There were interparty divisions uh, with the Democrats, uh, who I did have a lot of friends with. Uh, they uh, seem to be uh, very. Um, they have a lot of unity, a very strong message, but they were highly highly unorganized there in Spokane County. Whereas the Republicans uh, seem very fractured, but they they seem to have. Uh, uh, a lot of unity within those fractures. There was the, the establishment of Republicans, of course, and then there was the, the more or less the, the Tea Party and, and freedom people, liberty people, and then a, a few other people that were, were kind of in the middle. Um, but running as a Republican, I wanted to, to split the party and uh, see if I could take some, some Democrats with me. Um, union support, um, I was the only person, the only person in Spokane County history to ever take uh, the Spokane County Deputies Association endorsement away from the sitting sheriff. So even though I did not win the election, uh, that is something that nobody has ever done. And uh, I guess I'll be credited for that throughout history. I was able to, to raise uh, $40,000 uh, and each donation was limited to $950. So for someone who was a no-namer, uh, we, we really had a pretty good network for $40,000. Uh, the political obstacles that I had were, were very great. Uh, you see my opponent there. Um, and you see the person, you might recognize her, that's Kathy McMorris Rogers. She is fourth in line to the presidency. Uh, kind of hard to beat uh, a crowd like that. <laughs> so uh, he had a, a lot of friends, not only in Spokane County, but also in Washington, D.C. Uh, uh, I was told not to bring my signs to the, the fair. Uh, and when I showed up at the fair, it seemed that everyone else was allowed to bring their signs. Uh, when the, the local GOP put out their flyer of GOP candidates, you'll see on the left there, they conspicuously omitted me. Um, and after complaining about it, uh, they issued some stickers and put them on the, uh, the flyers that they hadn't sent out yet. Um, poor sportsmanship, but that's what I was dealing with. I also had to set up game cameras to catch people stealing my campaign signs. That, that right there is actually, you're seeing is a, uh, actually a local attorney. On the Republican side. So a lot of obstacles that I had to overcome and, and that was because I, I did form partnerships with the other side. I was friends with a lot of Democrats. I uh, was the only Republican to march in the gay pride parade. So I, I really broke some rules and I don't think they really cared for that too much. Um, the incumbent did win and uh, you see 594 passed which was the background investigation or the background law for, for firearms. But all the smart uh, justice candidates did lose, uh, which was, was remarkable. Um, and you see some of the raw numbers here. I took 30% uh, of the vote. My incumbent took uh, 100,000. Uh, he took 70%. I took about 30%. I had probably about seven union endorsements and, and seven. That's near the most for a Republican candidate. 
Uh, he took all the precincts except for one. I took uh, Fairfield, which uh, I didn't campaign in, but for some reason they really liked me down there. And I, I took that, I swept that, that precinct. Uh, interesting though, even though I raised $40,000, he raised over $100,000 and he spent all of it to defeat me, which I, I thought was very interesting because most incumbents don't, don't spend a lot of their money. Uh, the the, 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 uh, the uh, recorder for the, the county, she, she only uh, raised $8,000 and didn't spend hardly any of it uh, because she was an incumbent. But he spent $100,000 to defeat me. Um, but here's the study that I did. A dependent, dependent variable is, of course, the, the percentage of votes inside the, the precinct. The uh, independent variable is the, the pure voter contact. And anybody that, that got a flyer from me or got front door contact when I knocked on the door, I counted them as a contact. And of course, the, the, the controls that you usually see is age, gender, uh, party. Now, under votes are those people that refuse to vote in that election. They might have voted in a lot of the other elections on the ballot, but they refuse to vote in that election. Uh, that's important. We'll see here later. And local crime rates and then the household median income. Uh, the, the hypothesis was that the more voter contact that I had, the more votes that I would get. And I ran two models, one for me and then one for my incumbent. Um, and when I, when I ran the, the correlations, um, nothing surprising with the controls, but as you can see, I really got a good, you know, a, a significant negative relationship with votes and the pure voter cont uh, uh, contact, especially with the incumbent. So I'm thinking this is gonna develop nicely in a model. When we get to the models, uh, we get some significance, but you can see with my, my R squared there, I'm not really burning down any, any barns. Um, the explanatory uh, power there isn't really, a, a really great for the pure voter contact. The predictors were of course age, which we, we could understand, but also the undervote, the people who refuse to vote in that election. Um, I would chalk these up to the, the, the hardcore, you know, Democrats that just refuse to, to vote for um, uh, two Republicans. Uh, when I went door to door, there were some people that were going to cross party lines and, and were very proud to say that to me. Uh, but for the most part, this was a, a real predictor in this election. Now, on his side, the, the explanatory power is a little bit more in that uh, I was able to, to take away votes from him with my pure voter contact. Um, so when we, when we discuss this, and I'll take some questions here in just a second, but when we discuss this, uh, the geocoding is, is becoming a lot better if you want to study this. Um, the pure voter data is very, very expensive. Um, I paid probably about $1,500, almost $2,000 for just you know, 14,000 names and, and the data that's associated with them. Um, the extent of the incumbent's pure voter contact, I wasn't able to measure. Uh, he did, I know that he did very little door to door simply because he's the incumbent, but um, to what degree, I, don't, I wasn't able to measure that. And I think that's, that's poorly lost here. Also, sign placement. I spent a great deal of my money uh, on signs, yard signs and big you know, placards and advertising. So I wasn't able to really measure that in a, in a market sense and where those, those signs were placed, placed and how, you know, how effective that was. Um, the, the jail issue was table because I ran on a strong uh, platform of, of no new jail. They wanted to build, the incumbent wanted to build a $300 million jail and I was against that and, and laid out my plan for, for alternatives to that. So we did get that table. So that was, that was a very good, uh, I think uh, I credit our, our campaign for that. Um, this was the most effective campaign against the incumbent. He had uh, had other people run against him, but we seem to have uh, the most power at, at 30%, even though it's, it's not a very strong showing, it's, it's still 30% against him. Very popular, you know, Andy Griffith type sheriff. Um, and of course the, the, the deputy so sheriff's association endorsement, uh, you know, being the only person in history to ever take that, I think credits our campaign very well. Um, my information is there if you want to contact me, but I'll take some questions now. If anyone wants to jump in. Yeah, hi, uh, Doug. Um, this is uh, Rob Kirkland. Hey, Rob. Hey, thank you for your, uh, you know, thank you for your presentation. It's just uh, very, very interesting. And, uh, you know, it's just, it was, uh, it was one that, uh, you know, as, you know, the challenges I think that you point out as a, uh, you know, challenging a well entrenched incumbent is, uh, I imagine, is is a difficult thing. Um, you know, one of the things you mentioned about the pure voter that I, I find that I found uh, resonates is I live in a 
town uh, here it, that has a large number of um, elderly communities, like you know, care communities, yeah. and uh, <clears throat> in, in particular, and they vote as a block, and they are, uh, and if you are going to win in in our town, you have to. Uh, you know, address them because they all go out and vote. They all uh, are retired. And actually, this large community actually uh, uh, buses uh, their, uh, you know, people in their, in their large retirement community to the polling place. So uh, when you talk about pure voter and you talk about, you know, the retired person, you know, the, I think, you know, the importance of the engagement of, uh, of that audience is, is tremendous in being able to, I think, to win elections at the local level. I, I don't know if you could bring out any sort of examples from your experience in Spokane County. I can. In fact, that was one of the uh, more disappointing things that I encountered was that um, all of these elderly care centers had policies about uh, any kind of political outreach. No one could come there and talk to them. Nobody could uh, okay, that, that sounds their, good. I'll tell you that. So yeah, probably around probably in about uh, forty minutes. Okay, thanks. Um, probably, I would say only one even entertained the thought of having anyone come and speak to them. Uh, all the rest would not allow us any access to even even hand them uh, flyers or, or paperwork or anything. So, uh, yeah, I I think that was a really uh, an opportunity that we weren't able to take advantage of simply because these these places wouldn't allow us to. So. I would have, and that would have been a captive audience, but uh, certainly very disappointing for me. Okay, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Doug, for that. I have to say too that um, having never run for public office and doing it for the first time and, and running in a party against the incumbent, uh, I, I really, watching this last election here, uh, have some sympathy for Mr. Trump or the president. Uh, <laughs> you know, what, he, <laughs> what he went through, <laughs> it, was, it was very hard to sleep at night sometimes uh, when people you, people you thought were your friends uh, that were now uh, you know, horribly against you and uh, saying you know, lies against you. And it was, it was uh, really interesting to see how divisive, and we all think about how ephemeral politics really are, but, or is and uh, and how thoughtless it is, but yet how how divisive it is, and, and how I really lost a lot of friends running for office. So I, I have some sympathy if there for people who run within within their party and, and kind of split it. So hey, uh, Doug, uh, Tony Contento has a, a question for you. Basically, he's asking what happened to the uh, people that were caught on camera removing the campaign signs. And I think about, uh, I know that that seems to be a, uh, a common trend with a lot of elections. And I know that I've seen sort of uh, interesting videos on YouTube where actually some uh, candidates who run into that actually electrify their signs on their lawn so that somebody who grabs their sign gets a little bit of electrical jolt. But what, what, whatever happened to that lawyer that tried to remove that sign? Well, he uh, actually, I I put that picture up on Facebook. I put it everywhere. <laughs> and uh, uh, finally, he gave, he gave me a call because, you know, our campaign was really the first to really do that, to set up cameras and try to catch people doing that. Because it is a, it's a gross misdemeanor, even though people don't prosecute it simply because the person running for, you know, prosecutor was, was the prosecutor. So it's, you, you don't really see a lot of prosecution, even though it's a crime, but it's nice to, to embarrass people who do that. And I, he actually called me and said that, uh, his excuse was that the signs were placed, even though they were placed legally on the right of way, that uh, they were placed in front of where his community was and that they were distracting to the drivers when they wanted to pull out. And I think that was very weak, but I, I told him, I said, you know, you have a sign there in your community that says no soliciting. And I wanted to respect that. So I didn't come into your community and hand out my flyers, but yet I wanted to post, post my signs there legally on the right of way. And he was very apologetic, and even he even said, uh, "Look, I'll I'll make this up to you, and uh, bring bring me your flyers, and I'll make sure they get out to the homeowners association. Everybody gets a copy." So, even though it was an unfortunate situation for him and embarrassing, it was a win-win for me because I got all my flyers out in that community. Um, Mike Skiba asks. Um, 
what would be the main reason why you would or would not run again? Um, I am one of these guys that just reinvents myself every four or five years. And I think this running for political office was another way of reinventing myself. And over the years, um, I have tested and I think completely run out the goodwill of my wife. <laughs> so she has been a trooper through all of this. And I think uh, retiring after 30 years of law enforcement that uh, I owe her uh, my allegiance now after she's given me hers. And I think I won't run again. Uh, just solely for that reason. If, if someone tempted me and my wife said, you know, go ahead and do it, honey, I, I would give it a lot of thought, but uh, I'm a lot smarter now. And I know what I really need to do, what I have to do. And it, it is simply exhausting. And anyone who run, runs for public office deserves any, no matter who they're Republican or, or Democrat, if they simply run, I, they, they have my admiration. Yeah, um, Mike says a great answer on that. Um, we have another question that asks you, uh, uh, has this experience affected your approach to teaching in the classroom and, and, and how? Oh, it is. Uh, you talk about the relational aspect of that. What I am able to explain uh, to students, especially when it comes to what they think and what they know, you know, I'm, I'm able to say, okay, well, you say you believe this, but you know, test it, you know, how did you come to your conclusion and what facts did you rely on? And that, those two questions right there, how did you come to your opinion and what facts do you rely on are completely absent from every stinking political campaign possible. When you go to these forums, uh, people go to these forums to hear what they want to hear. They're not really interested in the truth. And so that becomes very difficult when you're a, uh, an academic, you know, like us, we, you go there and you want to talk about the facts. Well, the facts are incredibly boring to these people. And when I started doing that, a friend grabbed me who was running for office as well. And he said, Doug, you got to stop this. He says, look, he says, 90 seconds, fourth grade level with an emotional punch. That's what you're going to get away with. And he was right. Sadly, he was right. And I ended up having to do that to, to, to speak, you know, to identify with, with all of them. So it was, it was disappointing in that respect. But as far as the classroom goes, I'm able to, to share story after story after story about disproving something that I once believed and now no, whole, no, no longer hear, you know, hold dear. So, uh, wow, what a, what a valuable experience. If you do it, um, you'll never regret it. it. It'll be exhausting and it, uh, it, you'll, you'll wonder why sometimes at night, why you did it, but you will never regret it. It is one of the most, uh, going door to door, contacting the pure voter. I thought that, that was just gonna, oh man, I gotta go door to door, but it was intoxicating. I would. I couldn't wait to get out there every night and knock on a door. It was just amazing the people you would meet. Great, Doug. Um, you got several compliments on your photo here, and I want to ask you, uh, you know, uh, that, uh, you know, clearly you're younger, uh, better looking than your, uh, than your opponent. Did that, uh, do you, what, what it, as far as politics go, as far as, uh, you know, that, those kind of, uh, 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 you know, things that you had that you had to your advantage in this campaign? Oh, uh, you know, my, my opponent had, of course, the name recognition. But where I think I really, I really struck home was the fact that I had something new to share. I was I was able to relate to both sides. And, uh, you know, to be able to walk in, you know, to run as a Republican, and then to walk into a, a Democratic rotary, and to actually get their endorsement and then to walk out with checks, I mean, money. I mean, I was, I was able to relate that well. He wasn't able to do that. And had I been able to score at a greater level, I had a better showing, but I think that I was able to be a little bit more relatable to the Gen Xers. Uh, I did have a lot more youth. I think a lot of the Ron, the Ron Paul people came out uh, to support me. Uh, and they, were, they were relatively younger. And so I was able to relate to them and, and them to me a lot more than the incumbent. The incumbent was just, you know, like I said, Andy Griffith, uh, throw, them all, uh, throw them all in jail, uh, lock them up and throw away the key. And so, you know, I, I came across a little bit better, but I, I started out very rocky. I, I didn't know what I was doing uh, and I just had to get better at it. Um, we have another question for you, Doug. It says, in retrospect, do you think you would have done better if you had run as a Democrat? No. Um, in fact, uh, all Democrats lost in Spokane County at the county level. The only Democrat that won 
was again the recorder or the auditor. Um, she uh, has been the auditor for 16 years and her name goes out on all the ballots. And so she has instant name recognition. Otherwise, if you run in Spokane County, at the county level, as a Democrat, you're going to get 42% of the vote. It's always going to be 57, 42. That's what you're going to see. 57 Republican, 42. And all the races were like that. If you go back and check them over history, they're just all like that. So um, I just, you know, politically, uh, I don't really have any problem with the Democrats. It's just this, this idea of the reliance on government is just something that I, I just really haven't been able to identify with. And most of them really, really want to do that. And so that's their message. And I, I, I just, for something inside of me, I just, I just couldn't do that. Um, the Republicans uh, were very difficult to deal with in that uh, a lot of them, and my, myself, a person of faith, but in dealing with them, uh, they wanted to see how strong you were on the death penalty. And I was one of the ones that came up against the death penalty. And uh, they had a very hard time with that. And so uh, where I was able to relate with the Democrats, I wasn't able to relate with the Republicans. And where I was able to re relate with the Republicans, I wasn't able to relate with the Democrats. So it's, you know, pick your poison. Um, it's with, with academics like us who really, really base everything on fact and we want to be consistent. You know, politics is where people aren't consistent. Uh, do you think that you could have, um, just this is a follow up to this question that Kristen asked, was, um, you know, you see in some elections, one that comes to mind recently was uh, the Democratic governor of Louisiana, John Bell Edwards, who ran as a Democrat and was able to split the Republican vote and bring over enough Republicans and independents to the uh, Democratic side for him to win the state election in Louisiana. So that that wasn't something that a formula like that, like that wasn't in the cards for uh, Spokane County. No, simply because of what I was running for sheriff and, you know, the, the, the fiscal purse strings uh, belong to the county uh, council or the county commission. So I'm just affecting, you know, criminal justice policy based upon the resources that they give me. So I don't, I'm not able to take advantage of all the, the blue collar, you know, uh, Trump Democrat types, types, type stuff. So, you know, really people, they want to see bad guys in jail. They, 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 um, they, they don't want to see their money misspent and in, in, in that regard, but, as far as uh, you know, anyone running uh, for governor or anyone running as a politician or lawmaker, they can take advantage of a lot of the rhetoric. But as a, as a sheriff, you really can't. You're quite limited to policy. Great. Uh, a question from John is: uh, the Smart Justice Movement is fairly new. Do you think the pure voter didn't understand this platform versus looking at it as a major shift, would, which would intimidate them, especially as an older group? Yeah, it was it was very difficult to um, to try to persuade or convince you know the older person that uh, you know someone who's not violent shouldn't be in jail. Uh, their idea, in fact, what I, I saw door to door was you know their idea was that the more you punish people, the more sorry they're going to be. And I said, well, you know that, that's why we don't call them penitentiaries anymore because nobody's penitent. You know, I, I agree with you there, but I, I said, you know. We call them correctional institutions because the idea is to change their behavior. And at $130 a day, and I try to make it real to them, you know, at $130 a day, are you really getting your, the best bang for your buck? And if you could pay $25 a day for home monitoring for someone who isn't violent, someone who isn't going to hurt you, uh, would you rather pay that? And so I tried to make it relative to them, but they still felt that, you know, longer sentences meant, you know, a better, better value. And, and I, it was difficult convincing the older crowd of that. Thank you, everybody, for attending uh, Doug Orr's lecture. Thanks. Thank you so much. I appreciate it.